Uh, Professor Were is a qualified medical doctor uh, from the University of Nairobi and uh, also subsequently received both a master's and a doctoral degree in public health from the Johns Hopkins University. She has worked as a medical officer for the Ministry of Health in Kenya, a teacher in the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Nairobi. She has been a UNICEF Chief of Health and Nutrition, and then also a WHO country representative in Ethiopia. In addition, Professor Were has been a director in UNFPA for East, Central, and Anglophone West Africa, from which she retired in the year 2000. And following her retirement, she has held many key positions, including being chairman of Kenya National AIDS Control Council, chair of the International, AMREF International Board, a member of the board of the Health Workforce Alliance, and currently she's the chancellor of Moi University here in Kenya. Professor Awere's focus has been mainly on community health services, uh, including research and services, with evidence-based advocacy on the need to establish, support, and maintain community health services as the most cost-effective way to provide accessible quality health services. She has contributed in demonstrating that communities burden from preventable, communicable, and lifestyle diseases can be changed for the better in countries with successful community health workers. She has had many recognitions for her work, including UNICEF's Maurice Pet Award for innovative approaches to primary health care in 1978, Kenya's elder of the Burning Spear for outstanding contribution to the nation in the year 2005, Queen Elizabeth II Gold Medal for Public Health in the Commonwealth in the year 2007, and she is the first recipient of the Hideo Noguchi Africa Prize for Medical Services by Japan in the year 2008. And uh, she's a designated Kenya's Community Health Strategy Goodwill Ambassador, a title that she holds to date. Welcome, Professor Wele. Thank you. Thank you. Our second panelist is Dr. Gidinji Gitahi. Dr. Gitahi is the group CEO for AMREF Health Africa. Dr. Gitahi joined AMREF Health Africa in June 1, 2015. Until his appointment at AMREF Health Africa, Dr. Gitahi was the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa for Smile Train International, where he successfully established partnerships for long-term sustainable sustainability with various African governments. Prior to that, he worked with the Nation Media Group, where he was the managing director for the Monitor Publications in Uganda, as well as a general manager for marketing and circulation in East Africa. He has held progressive senior positions at Glaxo Smith Klein, uh, Smith Klein, Smith Klein mm -hmm. at Avenue Group, and the insurance industry. Dr. Gitahi has a bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery, a master's in business administration, majoring in marketing. And Dr. Gitahi is also the co-chair of the UHC 2030 steering committee, a global World Bank and World Health Organization initiative for universal health coverage. He's also a member of the private sector advisory board of the Africa CDC, and of the World Health Organization. Well, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gitahi, and welcome uh, to the panel. We are also very privileged today um, to have Mr. Genichi Terasawa. Mr. Terasawa is going to make a statement at the end of the uh, presentations by our two panelists. He is the director of um, Hideo Noguchi Africa Prize Office. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We feel privileged to have you in this panel, and uh, you'll be making a statement. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, participating today, we have quite an interesting agenda. 
And uh, after the speakers, you will have a chance to ask a number of questions. In fact, you don't have to wait until the session ends. We will take your questions on chat. Just chat and we will pick the questions because we may not, we will not have time for oral questions. So please remember, we are not going to have you talk, just chat and ask your questions. Now, before we start, I also want to appreciate the other people in the room. Uh, we have the AMREF Chief Programs Officer, Meta Kinoti. We have Dr. Nyagero who already started us off. We have Donna, uh, who is our regional advocacy manager. And we have a very important person in the room representing the people we are talking about today, Margaret Kilonzo, who is a community health worker. And she's here also to ask, answer any questions which may be asked and are relevant to her. So as we start off, I have two slides to start us with. The slides are being loaded. We are talking about community health workers, but uh, in what perspective? We need to understand how the current healthcare system works so that you see how this fits in to the overall picture. Okay. Um, yeah, so the health system, as for those who may know about this, is made up of six building blocks, which WHO has come up with. And they are there in this diagram. Leadership and governance as a block, healthcare financing, health workforce, medical products and technologies, information and research, and service delivery. And uh, the health system intends to improve access and coverage and quality of and safety of services. And if in this framework, if we implemented everything, then we should have improved health uh, and also responsive healthcare and uh, financial risk protection and improved efficiency. But you may notice something here that I've highlighted in red. There is a glaring gap when it comes to communities. The health system seems, the framework we use in the world today seems to have left out community health workers. Communities are not part of the health system as we know it today. And that is something we are going to talk about today. Now, if you take the service delivery pillar of the uh, building blocks of the health system as we conceptualize it, it's really a pyramid made up of the big referral health facilities at the apex, and then below it, you have the referral uh, regional health facilities in any country. Uh, then you may have district hospitals in countries like Kenya, you might have county and then district. You may have health centers and then dispensaries, and then what we are calling the community. Now, as you go up this uh, pyramid, the system gets complex and accessibility becomes more difficult. And so if you want to reach more people, you cannot reach them through the referral hospital. You can reach greatest number of people at the community level of the health system. That is where access reaches most people. Now the tragedy we have today is that we have concentrated in building this complex, complex uh, uh, block, the complexity of the system and providing healthcare, which is treating diseases rather than improving health. Because improving health is really through the community health system if it works. And so this has led to many issues that the panelists will be talking about. And so with that introduction, I want to introduce Professor Ere to take over and talk about the community health worker agenda and how relevant it is for our health systems today. Professor Well. Thank you very much, Professor Sul. I'm happy to make a, some comments on community health workers because I have been involved with any for nearly 50 years. Community health workers. I have worked in communities and seen traditional 
healers. Now, as you know, traditional healers can be quite dramatic. And uh, that drama is part of the culture. There are people who prefer to have community, who have traditional birth attendance, rather than modern maternity care. Because of the approaches, because of the, the things that go with that traditional birth attendance. And in many ways, the traditional lifestyles of our people don't always go hand in hand with modern healthcare. So, it becomes a problem because now, when a country is relying only on modern healthcare and ignoring completely the people, then a lot of people are left out. Because the meaning of health and disease in African cultures is not the same as modern medicine. There's, in Africa, we have many who have a sick role. We understand the sick role and how people should treat you in a sick role. I know myself, uh, when I used to use the health system, before I became a member of the health system team, I used to be so puzzled by the formal addressing of sick people but in the health system oh, oh, oh. as if they are not looking after you nicely like the traditional healers do they are not spoiling you they are not looking at you sympathetically and that is very important in our cultures and so this makes the social the, the modern health system a little bit disconnected from the people and a distance be, be, develops between the people and the expectations and what the health system offers they may be offering the best medicine, but that's how people, that's not how people see it. People see it as a problem. And so because of this, uh, the fact that the modern health system doesn't reach everybody, it has been recognized not only in Africa, but in other places as well. And they has imagined what is called the three delays model. The things that delay use of health services, especially with respect to maternity care or safe motherhood care. And in this three delays model, you have got delay in decision making to seek health care. Should I seek health care or not? The delays in getting to a health facility. Many of our, our facilities are very far from the people. And especially if you are talking about a pregnant woman who wants to deliver, how does she get to the facility? And then the delays in getting appropriate care at the health facility. This is, these are the three delays that are recognized. And when they are addressed, things improve. But things don't always completely improve, especially in the African setting, because there is a further delay which we don't always pay attention to. And that delay, the further delay, is the social distance, the issue of social distance. Now, the social distance, has contributed to communities mistrusting the health system. If you don't feel that the health system is relating to you, why should you trust it? Hmm? When epidemics come up like Ebola, people lack trust in the, in the communities. And so when the ministries say, do this and do the other, the communities don't want to do it because they ignore it because they don't trust the ministries. Social distance that keeps me, many women away to deliver at home, even though this may risk their lives, because they don't feel part of this system. Children don't have always receive appropriate care because, again, they don't feel part of this system. And the unfortunate part is that even if the ministries of health in Africa received all the money they want to build more facilities and build more palaces, what we call the disease palaces, they would not reach every Africa. So we must address the issue of social distance. We must address the issue because we have, many people have been left behind. Many people are currently left behind. And yet, we know that without good health, we cannot have productivity. And without high productivity, we cannot have economic development and overall development. So it is very important that we now turn to how to get everybody tied. Unfortunately, we are in the era of the development, sustainable development goals. And goal number three on health talks specifically of universal health 
coverage, leaving no one behind. And leaving no one behind gives us an opportunity to address the issue of the social distance that we find in African health systems. And the best way we have found to address this social distance is to have through community engagement, through community health workers, because they provide a, a, gap, a, a bridge between the people and the formal health system. But unfortunately, many current community health programs are not very efficient because we don't quite understand what they should be doing. We have different definitions. Many are recruited and even trained, but they drop out. We have as high a dropout rate as 70%. Those who stay in the system, the community health workers who stay in the system, try to find other jobs so that they can earn a living because most of them are considered as volunteers. They are not paid anything. So they try to find something to pay them and only pay attention to health work when they have time allows. And if this is the case, then it means that the community health workers donate their time when it is possible. But you cannot meet goals, you cannot hold them accountable if you are not having them all the time. And because of this lack of remuneration, remuneration there is no accountability for the work of community health workers, most community health workers, and what they are expected to do. So work is not done and the national goals are not, are not met. So what must we have? We must have, we must establish strengthened community health worker programs. And what do they look like? The first one is that they must be defined properly. Community health workers must be defined properly. They must have in-depth understanding of communities. They must be selected by the community through a participatory approach. Not just the chief sitting in his office and saying, I want Miriam whether to be a community health worker. No, a participatory approach. They must undergo standardized and accredited training so that they are trained properly to provide certain services. They must be trained to provide certain, a package of certain services to promote health, to prevent disease, and also to provide some first line curative services. And above all, community health workers must be recognized and remunerated as part of the health workforce. Not on the side, not an informal arrangement, not an under the table arrangement, but recognized formal health workers. So what, what does a student health, community health program consist of? It means that there is a strengthened community health work program. We should have selection of community health workers that involves the community with respect to age, gender, values, and who, people who are acceptable to the community. They must undergo accredited training so that they have competence in certain issues that they are going to be looked for. They must have a clear scope of work and their supervision must be structured and functional. So that this is a professional, a health worker whose duties are clear to the person and to the system and to the people who they are serving. Second, the community health worker must have a career progression clear to the community health worker and clear to the community and to the health system. Community health workers abandon their jobs when they realize that it's a dead end. You know, you are doing the same thing and you're not being, being paid and you're doing the same thing and you're doing the same thing for 20 years, for 50 years, or how long will you do it? So they abandon the thing. Civil service entry is not defined for community health workers currently, but it needs to be defined for a strengthened community health worker program. A strengthened community health worker program must have, comm commemorate, must have duties and payments and must be regularly paid, not just ad hoc. 
so that it is clear that the community health worker has these duties and these payments. And when we have strong community health worker programs, we know that it is a very important program in the country. The first point to be clear about is that community health programs do not cost more money to the government, they save money. Every successful community health work program, for one dollar, you get ten dollars worth of goods. So it is a way of saving money. Community health workers can fit into the civil service once they are trained, because they can fit into the civil servants like drivers, like office assistants, so that they are part of the normal civil service system. As to how much work the community health workers should do depends very much on the density of the population. And it can be decided upon country by country or area by area. We also know that in Africa and in other parts of the world, we have got nomadic populations and immigrant populations. This may require mobile community health workers. But these are adjustments that can be made without too much uh, distortion on the program. So if we can have a strengthened community health worker that is trained, that is paid, that is regular, and that is held accountable, you will have certain outcomes which are very useful to the health system. They bridge the gap between communities and the formal health system. Community health workers improve the confidence of communities in health, in the formal health system. I remember in my early 70s when I used to go to health facilities, you find the family that is just next door to the facility doesn't use the facility at all. So I would ask them, why are you not using the facility? Oh, those people, they don't behave properly. So the community health worker program that is working properly will reduce this, will, will improve the confidence of the people in the system. The community health worker program that is working properly will support the formal health system workers to understand and respect appropriate community norms. I say appropriate because some community norms can be a little bit strange. I remember going to one community and finding that they use cow dung on the umbilical cord to stop bleeding. So I asked them why, and they say because we have seen that when we cut our legs when we are digging, if you put cow dung there, it stops bleeding. But you know what that happens in a newborn? If you put cow down, you are just inoculating tetanus. So they die. And they say, oh, why are they dying? Now, that is a long story. But you can't always say all community norms are OK, but they must be observed. But what is good, like breastfeeding, for instance, is encouraged. And this combination of factors will reduce the social distance. And with reduced social distance, we shall have increased global health security. Because one of the problems we have right now is that what happens in a community, in one community, can become a dramatic problem for the whole globe. That's what we saw in, in, in Ebola. It was in a few countries, but we are all traveling up and down all over the globe. I, I understand there are something like 100,000 flights per day globally. So we can move our disease from here to there. So the more we can control the diseases locally, the better. And we in Africa believe that it must be through the community health worker program. Paid, respected, trained community health workers. So what should we do going forward? What we should do going forward is that one, NGOs, like Amarev and others must take a stand to support a formalized, integrated, and remunerated community health worker program. We must encourage the establishment of strengthened community health worker programs. Number two, governments need to recognize the importance of having strong community health programs so that they can develop appropriate community health program policies and that the community health program is implemented within the public service commission. 
not something on the side, not something under the table, but a public service commission program. And thirdly, development partners need to partner with communities and with government by putting money in strengthened community health programs. When we have volunteers, we think we have something when we have nothing, and we can't possibly afford that. We must have strong community health programs, programs that are, that community health workers that are paid, remunerated, that are trained, and that are held accountable for their performance because they are well supervised and supported. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. That is very insightful. And now we are going to have uh, Dr. Gidinji Gitahi take over. I just wanted to say uh, Dr. Gidinji has tested what it means to be a community health worker. And he has gone to the community and done that work together with Margaret Kilonzo, who is here, and others. So he's talking from a point of uh, experience in addition to the knowledge that he has. Dr. Gitahi, please welcome. Wow, thank you very, very much. Uh, Professor is always very inspiring when she's talking about community health workers because it is something she's worked on, researched on, and uh, seen for very many years. So my experience and uh, my ability to share on community health strategy is nowhere near what Professor Ware can do. And therefore, for me to be asked to make reflections on Professor Ware's presentation is an honor that I don't deserve. Uh, but I will give it a shot anyway. So thank you, Professor. We really appreciate it. Professor Mayer has talked about social distance, uh, which is a concept which is very difficult to capture or to grasp if you haven't experienced uh, the challenges of the health system in middle-income and low-income countries, especially where they are highly informal. Uh, the, the social distance that Professor Vere uh, has re referred to is to me one of the biggest contributors to a medicalized health system. The reason the health systems in low-income uh, countries and middle-income countries are highly medicalized is because the public health system, the community health system doesn't work, and therefore the health system is built to respond to medical treatment, surgical treatment, and such. It's actually built to respond to the failed prevention and promotive strategy. And until governments that are actually uh, looking to establish um, universal health coverage consider the closing the social distance gap as their best investment for UHC, we are not going to go anywhere because, as I saw uh, something that was asked with a linking tab, would you rather keep mopping or would you rather stop and close the tab? As long as we do not close the social distance, then we'll continue mopping the floor. And mopping the floor will never stop. And I think this is something also that I've seen in uh, some of, pre of Professor Vera's previous writings about the leaking tap and the fact that the, you know, for us to stop the leaking tap, uh, we have to go up to the community and let the community take ownership of the things they're doing. So for me, this concept of social distance that Professor Vera is introducing is really, really critical. So the question is then, why is it that government haven't understood this social distance? Why is it, and they're the ones actually who really understand the people or should understand the people, and where hasn't there been an investment in closing the social distance? I think in my view, there are many errors that have happened over time, since the Alma Hatta 1978 and even before. And even by the time the WHO was uh, convening and, um, and the structuring the, um, the building blocks of the health system. There were errors, there were systematic errors that occurred. One of those errors was to think that you could have a system that was supply side only and not and ignore the demand side of the system. And therefore, what in my view was created as a building blocks of health system was actually the supply subsystem. The supply subsystem which reflects the six building blocks that Professor Osu has referred to, is not a health system. It is a, sub, it's a health subsystem. And for me, the other part of the system of health should be the demand side, the community. Because if you create a supply, 
you must complete that supply with linking the demand so that you have a complete looped health system. Because the two of them form subsystems, supply and demand, and then you must close that. And the way to close that is through establishing an investment path for the community health strategy through the community health workers and everything else that Professor Berry had talked about in terms of linking them to the health system, training, regulation, supervision, ensuring that they are actually uh, compensated so that they are part of the health system. So that for me is one of the biggest errors of the health system, that is a subsystem rather than a system. The next issue is what I would refer as the WHO norms. Now the WHO norms of human resources for health, again, are based on a medicalized health system. Is they're based on a medicalized supply subsystem, where we say that actually um, the, our biggest investment is medicalized cadres, and therefore we miss out the fact that even as we do the ratios, the number of or the type and skills mix of health worker needed in a low-income country, that's highly informal, are actually different from a highly formalized developed economy. And therefore, we must review the WHO norms for them to be reflective of a complete system that also looks at demand side and what the population services require. And therefore, even as we talk about ratios of workers, we must disaggregate them and say, in this kind of environment, this is the ratio of community health worker to population you need, this is the ratio of nurses to population you need, instead of looking at it from a medicalized point of view and say doctors, nurses, dentists, pharmacists. So that is the other error, in my view, that we need to correct. The other final error that we need to correct is to imagine that actually you need community health, you can only have community health workers when you are rich. You actually need to have community health workers because you are poor. So we must then refocus our resources because we are poor, we must invest in community health workers. Because our fiscal space is small, we must invest in community health workers. We must not invest in community health workers when we have extra money after we've invested in the bottom or the top-down kind of health system uh, that uh, was shown earlier by Professor Su. So as long as we understand that the reason we need to invest in the community health strategy is because our fiscal space is poor, and then we'll be moving forward to the place where we need to be. So uh, these are my quick reflections on the excellent Professor Ware presentation. But I'd also like to uh, you know, reflect on uh, a few countries that have actually attempted this. We know we have a few countries that have looked at the community health strategy in terms of an area of investment. And uh, one of those is uh, Ethiopia. We know Ethiopia has invested in community health strategy. But the Ethiopia system has tended to kind of um, uh, you know, take a, an upgrading approach and has a one-year training, and then has kind of uh, uh, still has the community health workers. But I think one of the areas that we, we, we might have to look at the, at the Ethiopian model is as to whether the community health workers they train work in the areas where they're identified or whether they're actually posted after the training. So because you know, of essence, the community health workers must work within the communities where they're identified because the social distance is closed by understanding the social and cultural norms of the people and having a very high level of trust by being from that community. The next country that has attempted this is Rwanda. Rwanda has taken an approach where they have community health volunteers, not workers. There are 45,000 of them, and they receive an incentive, not a salary through a cooperative system. So they are put in a cooperative system, and then the cooperative is given some money, and that money is supposed to be invested in, in kind of income generating activities, which the community health volunteers then share. So again, not fully formalized, but it is a good, it's a good approach because it kind of has a good supervisory mechanism. They are required to report, they are supervised, and they are regulated, and they have a way of linking to the health system. But the best that I've seen so far in Africa is Sierra Leone. That Sierra Leone has actually uh, established over time what they call the National Community Health Strategy, and the most recent one, which was launched in 2016, which is the National Community Strategy 2016-2020, actually states that community health workers will be part of the formal health system, will be remunerated, and states that they'll be given $15 a month, and will be supervised and will be part of the health system. And that is now in effect, and in a country where um, the per capita income is $1,300 a year. Uh, you know, when you compensate a community health worker $150 a year, you know, it's, it's okay, it's a place to start. 
as opposed to places where they are left to be purely, uh, you know, volunteers. So for me, I think in terms of reviewing examples, I would say that the best example that people can look at in terms of uh, a strategy that is already policy, that's already been implemented by a government, is the Sierra Leone uh, case study. So I think I'll send back to the moderator. And thank, thank you, you very much, Prof. Thank you very much. And very important reflections. Now I want to ask uh, uh, Mr. Genichi Terasawa thank you. to make a quick comment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, today, it's my great honor to attend this uh, the webinar uh, meeting hosted by Amre Health Africa. My name is Genichi Terasawa, the director of Hideo Noguchi Africa Prize Office, the government of Japan. Uh, Professor Awere is a laureate of the first Hideo Noguchi Africa Prize in 2008. So maybe you ask, what is uh, the Hideo Noguchi Africa Prize? Okay, let me give you a short brief. In 2006, the government of Japan uh, established the prize to improve public health in Africa and advance the global fight against infectious and other diseases prevailing in Africa. It does this by recognizing, honoring people and organizations laboring at the vanguard of this battle. The prize is an unprecedented prize focusing on activities to fight infectious or other diseases in Africa. It is expected to encourage people dedicating themselves to medical services and to set a better role model to younger followers of medical services. The prize also contributes to upgrading medical services needed in Africa. Now, I'd like to introduce the reason why the government of Japan awarded the prize to Professor Were. For 50 years, Professor has dedicated herself to improve the health and welfare of people in Africa. As chairperson of the National AIDS Control Council of Kenya, Professor put together a balanced strategy for tackling HIV AIDS and successfully reduced HIV infection rates and AIDS fatality rates in Kenya. During her time as a board chairperson of AMREF, she tripled Kenya's national health budget and led the expansion of medical services to rural villages through a community-based approach to health services. Professor Were also manifested her outstanding leadership as a co-founder of the Uzima Foundation to encourage and promote positive behavior amongst the youth. Under her leadership, drug addiction among Uzima youth participants has dramatically dropped and the sexual reproductive health has shown significant improvement. Professor has also persistently exercised her tireless efforts and selflessness in the aid of those who are less fortunate and desperately in need of medical attention. During her various careers in many international organizations, such as UNICEF, WHO, UNFPA, Professor Were is now promoting Mother and Child Health Handbook in Kenya as a part of efforts to mitigate high mortality rates of mothers and children in Africa. Please understand, it is impossible to cover all her achievements in these short remarks. Finally, let me underscore our determination to com commit the African development. Japan has repeatedly held large forums with African state leaders since 1993 in order to improve social economic conditions in Africa, mainly through grant aid and technical assistance. The forum was named as the Tokyo International Conference on African Development, or TCAT. The improvement of the public health and welfare consistently has been one of key agendas at TCAC from the viewpoint of uh, human security. Now, Japan is planning to hold the seventh TCAC in Japan in August of the next year, 2019. Taking the opportunity of the conference, the award ceremony of the third Hideo Noguchi African Prize will also be organized in the presence of African state leaders. 
We hope the prize will be a symbol to open a new chapter of the cooperation between Japan and African countries to promote the public health and welfare in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we want to revert to the comments by participants and questions. I see we have uh, 88 gadgets which are on. And I think each gadget may have many people. So I believe we are dealing with uh, quite a number of people participating in this <laughs> webinar. There have been very many inspiring comments. Allow me to read just a few. I think everyone is appreciating very much the panelists and um, very happy with the insightful remarks from the three of you. I find a comment here very important. NGOs can coordinate the execution, but government leaders need to lead the charge from the front, not from the back. I think that's a very important comment from Tyrell, uh, one of the participants, another one. Um, from Patrick Kagurusi in Uganda. Thank you, Professor Were. Government should relax the laws, regulations that restrict the admission of community health workers into the national workforce. Mm -hmm. I think there is a policy issue uh, because governments are not allowing these people to do their work. I will also, before we go to questions, make other comments, read other comments here. Uh, the communities should be mobilized to demand for the recognition of community health workers. And so I think someone is thinking about accountability and making communities speak out. And there are many other comments. Let me go to questions. Maybe I will read a few and the panelists can respond and then we read others. There is one here. Um, how does one dollar save $10? In other words, what do you mean when you say community health work programs save money? I think that is very important and Professor Were can respond to that. And uh, for Dr. Gidinji, there is a question on UHC. Uh, if I summarize it, it simply asks, if you take the Kenya example and the process of implementing UHC that they have put in place, where are they putting community health workers? Where are community health workers in that process? Yeah, please. Well, you know, one of the costly one of the highest costs of, of health, of health ministries of health is a disease, diarrhea, measles, open cough, and these are all preventable diseases. So by putting money in prevention, you reduce the cost of the disease. By putting money in promotion, you reduce, I mean, if you, if, if you look at the cost of vaccine, say of a vaccine of diarrhea, it costs less than one hundredth of the cost of treating diarrhea. If you put the cost of measles vaccine to treating measles, which you can, many times you don't even succeed because many children die. So you see, the matter of saving is because you have prevented the disease or you have promoted the health so that people don't get sick. So that if you don't get sick, you're productive and you don't have to spend, nobody spending money on you because you're spending very little money because it's just to help you eat better, exercise more, and that way and, and, and so on. And you wash your hands, you protect yourself and your family from disease because the cost of disease is the problem. And community health approach emphasizes prevention and promotion so that the cost of disease does not stay so high and therefore becomes cheaper to handle. And that's how you save money. Okay. okay. Thank you, Prof. I think the question on UHC and Kenya is an important one. Um, Kenya started its journey and one of the areas they have identified as key is to design the essential benefits package 
Now, the essential benefits package, which has been designed by Kenya through the Ministry of Health, starts from the bottom, recognizing that there will be population services and individual services. Now, population services are promotive, preventive, and those will need to be delivered essentially by community health workers. And then there is a referral process of making sure the individual services are referred to the facilities. Now, the challenge I think we have under, uh, in Kenya is, is the challenge of devolution. It's not a negative challenge, it's just a challenge that we have to address because the question of ownership of community health workers and where they are budgeted for is a question that is facing Kenya now. Is uh, ideally based on the devolved health services, the community health workers should be employees of the county governments. Uh, but it is also a public good for the government to make sure that we invest in community health workers. So this is where the current tension is. But the national government has prioritized that they are going to have community health workers engaged and uh, paid for under the universal health coverage agenda. But for us to do that and make sure it's sustainable beyond the current government, is that there will have to be legislative changes in parliament uh, that also affect the Public Service Commission to make, to make sure that the community health workers are defined as a cadre, they have a scheme of service, and they can be employed, and their job description is clearly defined beyond the current government. And that is where now the challenges have to be addressed to make sure it is legislative. Thank you. And there is a recurring question here, asked by many people, but in different ways. Um, how do community health workers differ from the other cadre? Someone is asking, why can't we deploy community health nurses to work in the community rather than community health workers? Someone is also asking, what are we going to do with public health officers if we are talking of community health workers? In other words, I think there is a, a difficulty here. We are asking for another cadre, and yet there are many other cadres who seem to be doing the same work. Professor Vere, what, 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 what is this, what is the difference? What is the value that the community health worker is adding that we don't seem to have right now? And uh, for Dr. Gitahi, there is another interesting question because we talked about how the complexity of the health system is a success. And someone is saying, are we not going also to make community health complex? How can we make it simple so that it delivers? Because we could still end up making it complex and, and inaccessible. Yeah. The difference, one of the, dif uh, uh, the differences that exist between other health workers and community health workers depend on a number of factors. The first one is that the community input in the community health worker selection and the deployment is not in the others. You don't have to have a particular orientation to a particular community to be trained as a nurse or a public health officer. You just qualify on your paper because you performed well in an examination and you are trained to do those things. But for the community health workers, the first consideration is that the community health worker is from that community, is selected by the community, is trusted by the community, and is understood by the community, and understands the community. That is one consideration. The second consideration is that in most training programs, say community nurses and public health officers, these are training programs that take two to three years in most countries. Now, those are long-term programs. They, because they take so long, the salaries are also very high. Therefore, the idea that you can have nurses in every community becomes impractical. You cannot manage to train sufficient numbers. So even Ethiopia, which is a bit long in training, is only one year's training for health extension workers. But in many other countries, like Rwanda and elsewhere, the training of community health workers is a short course. It is a short course not because it is cheap or not because it is low quality, but because it focuses on certain issues that can be done at the community level. Therefore, the fact that it is focused on the community and prepared specifically for the community, it is appropriate, while the others are not. And lastly, it is very costly to try and put a nurse in every community. If the governments are afraid to put community health workers in communities because they are costly, imagine putting public health officers and nurses at the community, in every community, not in only in some, in every community. 
And it becomes prohibitive to the extent that it cannot be done. So this is why we must focus on community health workers for the community level. Good. And, and I, I actually think that the question that has been asked, the further question about complexity, refers very clearly to what Professor Vere has answered. That the structure for community health workers recognizes that the health system has nurses and public health officers. It's not a replacement. It recognizes that those structures exist, but because they are highly trained and scarce, they then are utilized to supervise, not to do the work of community health workers. Actually, community health workers also releases the time for the nurses to do more of skilled work that they have been trained in, but not to do the work that actually the community workers can do at short-term training. In the case I talked about in Sierra Leone, the total time for training community workers is 24 days. It's exactly what Professor Wery say. It's just a short term to understand a basic package of community-based disease uh, on health programs, and then you assist the nurses. So don't bring the nurses now to do what can be done by lower cadre, because then actually what you're doing is creating inefficiency in a higher trained, skilled person. So the, to simplify, these same people who actually reach the facility level, which is the health center of the dispensary, are the people who supervise. So the community health workers are not creating a parallel health system. They are being attached to the existing health system at the facility, but to work with the community directly and to report back to the facility where the health system already exists, to refer back to the facility where it already exists. So they're not simplifying, they're not uh, complicating, they're actually simplifying the health system and making sure that demand creation is uh, paid attention to. Thank you. And a very interesting comment here, uh, someone quoting Professor Were from another event you had, that you said, if it's not happening in the community, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I have, found, I have found that, you know, we sit at the headquarters of the government and the counties and say, we are going to have this and we are going to have this, but it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Until it's happened in the community, I can say for the last 45, for 50 years, Unless, when it happens in the community, then it happens. If it doesn't happen in the community, it doesn't happen. Yeah. You still find the children with the dirty hands, with unwashed faces. If it doesn't happen in the community, it doesn't happen. Yeah, correct. And, and you know, maybe just to add to that, I was talking to, I had gone today to visit Madrid Kilonzo, who is a community health worker in Kibera. And we were talking to her house and I was asking her, so in this community, if a woman calls, has labor at night, what does she do? She says, they call us. It's the community health workers, they call. Who else would they call in the facility? You know, the facility is so distant because of this social distance. They call someone they trust, and then that person then finds a way to get them to the nearest facility for care. So this is what we are talking about. The community health workers, you cannot get nurses to do this role. This role is for community health workers. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think there is a lot about government and its role everywhere. Everyone is saying government should take leadership. In fact, many people are saying in these comments that government is the obstacle because of lack of policy. And I don't know what you can say about this. Are our governments doing enough? Uh, so, Professor, do you want to say something before I give my view? <laughs> the problem we have had, first of all, when I started doing work in communities, my biggest opponents were my professional colleagues. Somehow they felt threatened. And, but instead of saying that we are threatened, they would say, how can you let ignorant women and men work like health professionals? And at, at that time, in my time, at the time I was trained as a medical doctor, we had 10% coverage, which means 90% were looking after themselves. So I would ask them, 90% are already looking after themselves. So they are being looked after by these ignorant people, so-called ignorant. How come they are not all dead? How come they are not all dead if we are only 10% coverage? So it is a misunderstanding which comes from the health professionals. Fortunately, it has changed a lot. And because of this, the health professionals has, have influenced the government to undervalue the opinion of the people. And so they think that working with the people is a waste of time. So they need to pay attention because if for no other reason, for financial reasons, that they, we cannot afford a doctor in every village, but we can afford a community health worker in every village with better health results, as has been shown in Rwanda and, and even in Kenya. Yeah. We have got evidence that with a community health worker, you have better results than if you put there Miriam Mwere as a medical doctor to work as a medical doctor. 
So I think it is a matter of the government leadership. And we pray and hope that Africa will have the right leadership in the sector as well. Because when they do, health improves fantastically. Fantastically. Yeah. I think my comment is finally is that this is an issue from what I've seen of the presidency of the country. We have tended to make it an issue of investment and the Ministry of Health, but community health workers is a major policy decision that also requires great political will and requires to employ thousands of people. That will not happen because the Minister of Health talks to the Minister of Finance. It will happen because the president of a country made a decision to say that we are going to focus on the people. That's what we saw in Sierra Leone, that's what we've seen in Ethiopia, that's what we saw in Rwanda. It is not a technical problem. It is actually a leadership issue. And that's really a great point to end. It's a leadership issue. So if our leaders decide that we will have health in Africa and not just health care, we will have it. It would be nice for Margaret to say hi to the people. If you have anything to say before you end. OK. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to see that you are concerned about the community health workers and recognize the work we are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Margaret. Thank you everyone for attending and now I invite uh, uh, Dr. Nyagero to tell us about the next webinar in the series and when it will be. Thank you everyone. I think we appreciate that you have been with us. We are again inviting you to join us on 29th of October. Same time and that time we shall be focusing on a webinar that is going to focus on enhancing governance and accountability at national, regional, and global level to achieve universal health coverage. Thank Once you. again, thank you very much. Let's meet again on the 29th of October. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I should sit next to you always. I learn a lot from you through osmosis and diffusion. Oh. <laughs>